Next up on the agenda is uh, Dr. Edwin C. May. Uh, Edwin C. May spent the first part of his research career in his chosen PhD degree discipline, Low Energy Experimental Nuclear Physics, which he earned in 1968 at the University of Pittsburgh. His dissertation was Nuclear Reaction Studies via the Reaction on Light Nuclei and the Reaction on Medium to Heavy Nuclei. Before leaving this career in experimental nuclear physics, he had published 10 papers in the peer-reviewed physics literature, including his report on the first measurement of the single state of the deuteron, which appeared in the prestigious journal Physical Review Letters. Dr. May became interested in serious research of psi phenomena in late 1975, when he joined the ongoing U.S. government-sponsored work at SRI International, formerly called Stanford Research Institute. In 1985, he became the program's director, and in 1991, he shifted the government parapsychology research effort to Science Applications International Corporation. Dr. May has managed complex interdisciplinary research projects for the U.S. federal government since 1976, and he presided over 70% of the funding and 85% of the data collection for the government's 22-year involvement in parapsychological research. His responsibilities included fundraising, personnel management, proper project administration and planning, and he was the guiding force for the technical research program. Under Stargate, he authored or co-authored 300 formerly classified reports to various U.S. government agencies within the military and intelligence communities. His association with government-sponsored PSI research ended in 1995 when the program, then called Stargate, was closed by the U.S. government. When the research was finally declassified in 2000, Dr. May was able to publish groundbreaking results and theories in the peer-reviewed literature. Since that time, many additional papers have appeared in the peer-reviewed technical journals. His technical presentations, mostly to skeptical audiences, have been accepted worldwide, and some of the venues have included Harvard University, the Universities of California at Los Angeles and at Davis, Stanford University, the University of Edinburgh, Trinity College, Cambridge, the University of Stockholm, Imperial College, London, and Moscow State University. The Parapsychological Association granted him the Outstanding Achievement Award in 1996, and for his contribution and research excellence, the association presented him the Outstanding Career Achievement Award in 2007. He was president of the Parapsychological Association in 1997 and has often served on its board of directors. Currently, Dr. May is the executive director of the Laboratories for Fundamental Research. Since its founding in 1996, 13 of 17 of this laboratory's research proposals uh, submitted to private foundations have been supported. Finally, he has also asked that I mention his ability to walk on water <laughs> and that he believes his best physical feature to be his cute legs. <laughs> Much more could be said about Dr. May's long and accomplished career as he is the author or co-author of many more papers, proposals, and presentations from both of his career activities. But without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Edwin C. May. <laughs> Can you hear me? Is the mic behind my back on OK? okay. Great, thank you. First off, I have to defend poor Chris. Uh, we, with some friends, were out for dinner last night, and we bribed him and cajoled him to put in those final silly remarks. 
And I'll warn you, I'm not going to take my pants off to show you my two legs. <laughs> OK, so um, how do we get started here? All right. Um, a little bit of, uh, I would say, warnings here, or better yet, if you look at the slides up here in the upper hand corner, you don't have to read what's on the slide, nor do you have to listen to me. It tells you everything that's on the slide of interest, in case you get bored. Um, and I tried to make that the case all the way through this presentation, but not on every single one of them. Um, this is my co-author. We're going to introduce her shortly. Um, this is the dates, which were here. Okay. Um, roadmap. That looks like a road, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, introduction of two authors. We're going to do psychic things. Um, what is the definition of a psychic? What psychic research looks like? I promise you, zero geek factor. No charts, equations, and Lots of examples, so you don't have to run out of the room screaming. Examples, 11-minute video, which will tell you what it's like under la semi-laboratory con conditions, but it was a nationally broadcast program. Introduction to the Stargate program. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, introduction of the Stargate program, Stargate archives, now at Rice University, and thank you, Jeff, Amanda, and the magnificent staff of the Wood Woodson Research Center. Uh, I had a um, tour there the other day, and literally I was moved to tears about the magnificent work that was done. I couldn't have done it. I don't even know how you pulled that off, but you did. And thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Spying and other examples, and some stories about the Russians, and some Q&A at the end of this. Hold on, buckle up. OK, guiding principle. And with all due respect to those who really know how to talk Sanskrit, this is anubhadraha kratavo yantu vishvataha. This means uh, let auspicious knowledge uh, come to us from every side. I learned that from Dr. Eskin Goderin. Uh, he and I were best buddies in graduate school. He was doing nuclear chemistry, and I was doing nuclear physics. But our experiments were the same. And so in 1971, I went to my first visit to India. And that's what he looked like then. And uh, this is what I looked like then also. And I don't know what all that fuzzy stuff on the top of my head is. It seems to have vanished. OK, the authors. Me, you know about. Sonali Bhatt Marwa is a very, very interesting, extremely brilliant woman. She has a PhD in psychology with an emphasis in neuropsychology. Uh, she's Gujarati, but she grew up in, in Bombay. Um, she's worked for me for quite some time, and I have to admit, all of our theories and all of the philosophies come from her. And she is, we sky, uh, do Zoom twice a day, and she frequently reminds me, shut the F up. I speak and write better English than you do, and that's correct. <laughs> OK. Psychic things in daily life. I wanted to start this stuff not as a geeky presentation, but rather let it just experiences we all have. So, uh, knowing who is calling before answering the phone, Rupert Sheldrake did a very careful study on that, and it seems to work. Dogs who know when human pals are leaving the office many miles away. Very carefully, well-designed study, again by Rupert Sheldrake. Suddenly knowing a dear person has passed away, and if you allow me a personal experience with that. Um, Arthur Hastings, a well-known researcher, uh, he, he did this. Uh, analysis and put off in targets early remote viewing, he became very ill with a, a rare blood disease. And that ended up as cancerous. And I had the pleasure, it's hard to say pleasure, of being at his house on a sunny evening. He was unable to speak. He was in hospice care. But he could mutter stuff. And his wife translated uh, what he had to say with me, uh, with Diane and I. And he asked me, uh, Is it, do I have any questions? And I said, yeah. Uh, are, are you uh, in any pain? He said, no, I'll die quietly in my sleep. Eventually, that's what happened. But I said, hey, uh, Arthur, let's do an experiment. When you die, come and pitch my butt. And if that works, I will change my whole attitude toward survival after bodily death. And he said, done. We had this handshake and a warm, tearful goodbye. 
And it came time on, that was on a Sunday night. On Wednesday morning, I woke up with a start. You could set off World War III, and I'm not going to wake up. But I woke up at quarter of one in the morning, and oh, my watch is broken. So I went downstairs to my computer, and sure enough, that was the right time. That was the moment that he passed away. Okay. Um, so last year, um, a dream that comes true. We've all had that experience. Making wise decisions in the absence of, nece of necessary data. This is a marvelous book I'd recommend getting, although it's very old. Uh, Douglas Dean and others uh, in, in inserted into uh, normal uh, executive training sessions in New York, a covert ESP test. And the end result of all that was that the executives who, do, who afterwards say, we don't believe in ESP at all, but their salaries correlated with the scores on the secret ESP test. Of course, one, one of the things you come away with that is you get paid the big bucks for making slightly wiser decisions in the absence of data, and that's what uh, executives have to do anyway. OK, so how do we find a psych and why the hell bother? It's a lousy way to communicate. We can all play chopsticks in the piano, but very few of us can do <laughs> can perform uh, at Carnegie Hall. About and this is a crude number, so don't yell at me. About one percent of, of of the population can meet uh, laboratory standards for uh, being psychic. Now that is a very high bar, and uh, people exceed it all the time in real life, as we've heard numerous examples in this uh, present in this conference. The only way we found to find psychics is to ask people to give it a try. I'd end up in a room like this, and we would show it, uh, have a target generated after it, and everybody would respond. And for technical reasons, that's not a valid thing to do. But we'd take the 10 best and bring them into the laboratory and study them. And that's how we found some of our really top remote viewers. OK, understanding psychic, psychic phenomena might, and the emphasis might, inform us about how we humans are related to each other and to the environment. It might teach us more about how our brains work. It may answer the questions we humans have been asking ourselves ever since we could scamper down from the trees, even though some of us haven't quite made it down the trees yet. We're still working on that. Uh, but these are very, very important questions. It's not clear that this phenomenon that we're all interested in in this room will answer any of these questions. But as Chuck Onerton said once, it at least puts tools in our toolbox that hopefully somebody in the future will help to answer these really important questions. OK, now to the actual story. Um, a psychic can, be inform uh, can, can obtain information without any of the, the known five senses. And I think many of you know we all have more than five senses, echolocation and magnetic field sensing and so on. But focus this on the five. We define our, our problem as an atypical perceptual ability, the, uh, the acquisition of non-inferential information. And that's an important point, and that's why I've emphasized it, arising from a distant point in space-time. There are other names that are used for the same phenomena. We call it nowadays informational psi. The issue here is if you are trying to outguess the stock market and you go on looking at uh, technical analysis, that's not non-inferential information. So that's what I mean by non-information. Non OK. This is an 11-minute video. That's Joe McMonagle in the upper corner. Um, he was invited by ABC on a program that went away fairly soon, I'm afraid, called Put to the Test. And it's a real-time remote viewing. You'll see how it works in the laboratory. Uh, they spent uh, 150K on the single example. And I trained the person who you'll see here in Houston uh, pick the targets. So here we go. Extrasensory perception, ESP. We've all heard of someone who says they have it. And scientists from around the world have spent decades trying to explain it. Well, you're about to meet a man who claims to possess this extraordinary ability and has allowed us to put him to the test. <laughs> For most of his adult life, Joe McMonagall was a professional soldier. Two brutal tours of Vietnam, U.S. Army intelligence, a Legion of Merit award winner, a black and white world clearly defined and limited to his five senses. But in 1970, Joe claims that world was turned inside out. In a restaurant, 
Joe suddenly felt ill and staggered outside. This is the first time he's told his story on television. It was sort of a pop, and I found myself standing on a cobblestone road watching the, uh, the rain go through my hands and uh, looked up and saw my body sort of half in, half out of a doorway. I knew at that point that I was probably dead. Joe was rushed to a hospital where he arrived, showing no signs of life. It felt as though I was falling backwards. I was enveloped by a white light. So here you are, you've almost died. And then all these strange things start happening to you. What's going through your mind? It shattered all my concepts of reality. I started having spontaneous out of bodies. I'd lay down for a nap on the couch or something, and I'd just find myself suddenly out of my body somewhere else, totally. Joe also claims he started having other unexplainable experiences, like knowing what complete strangers were thinking. For eight years, he kept his extrasensory perceptions to himself. Unbeknownst to Joe, 3,000 miles across the country, this man, Dr. Edwin May, and a select group of investigative scientists were just beginning to study extrasensory perception, ESP. When I first got involved with this, I was very skeptical. I said, if this is real, it's critically important. After 20 years, I've come to the conclusion something interesting is going on. How do you study ESP in the lab? Well, scientists developed an experiment called remote viewing. The person being tested is placed in a closed room. A researcher then goes to an unknown location, and the subject is asked to use ESP to draw what that researcher is seeing. Over the past 20 years, Dr. May has conducted thousands of these remote viewing experiments. In 1978, he started testing Joe McMonagall, and Dr. May claims Joe has drawn scores of unknown sites, 50% of the time with remarkable and unexplainable success. One of his best hits, uh, we had a person that was in the administration building at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. And all Joe drew was the laboratory, a perfect plan view of what this laboratory looks like. The interesting thing is, Joe's never been to Livermore. And this person could have been hiding anywhere in the entire continental USA. We've looked in the laboratory to figure out what's special about Joe. We've looked medically, neurophysiologically, physically, behaviorally, in every way one can look at a human being. And the good news is Joe is boringly normal like the rest of us. What we are proposing is that there is a sixth, an additional sense, that is responsible for what Joe does in the laboratory and in the real world. Does Joe McMonagall actually have a sixth sense, a sense which cannot be explained? To test his abilities, we flew him here to Houston, a city to which he's never been. For Joe, it would be like finding a needle in a haystack. The needle, a random location. The haystack, the 5,436 square miles that make up Greater Houston. We hired a movie location scout who spent five days finding a wide variety of distinct target sites. I think all of them have dramatic Houston elements with very defined architectural styles. And, you know, one of the things that I did not want to do is repeat any common denominator. I did not want there to be uh, two archways. Um, I didn't want there to be two triangles in, in the visual. Following Dr. May's scientific protocol, the producers reduced the hundreds of possible sites down to four. A life-size treehouse on the George Ranch. A visually dramatic portion of the theme park Astro World. The Ship Channel at the Port of Houston Authority. <clears throat> and a famous local landmark, the Water Wall. Without Joe's knowledge, those locations were photographed and placed in numbered envelopes at our downtown headquarters. We hired Officer Bill Baker of the Houston Police Department to retain custody of those envelopes. With Joe McMonagall sequestered in a windowless, soundproof room, we placed the four numbered envelopes in an adjacent room. To choose our final location, Julie Wieson, a local marketing executive, was asked to roll the dice. So the number is two. 
So, Officer Baker, why don't you take envelope number two? For the test, we selected Jessica Miller from the Houston Visitors Bureau to be what the scientists call the target person. Inside envelope number two was the photograph of the Houston Ship Channel. It would be Jessica's job to go to the target site and carefully observe every detail. In theory, through ESP, Joe might actually be able to see the location through Jessica's eyes. We would simultaneously record both Jessica and Joe. So while they drove, Joe began what he calls his cool-down period, similar to meditation, clearing his mind of all outside distractions. After 30 minutes, it was time for our test to begin. I had no knowledge of any of the locations. We have been uh, radioed that our crew and our target person are now on site. So I'm going to show you a picture. This is our target person. Have you ever seen her before? No, I've never seen her before. Describe for us the environment that she's in. For television purposes, we've condensed the 15-minute session. Remember, these are the four locations in the envelopes. But all Joe knows is that the location is anywhere in greater Houston. First impression of getting this kind of a, uh, I'm going to call it a river for lack of a better name. My sense is that it's both natural and man -made. So there's probably been something done to this river. Uh, it's been dredged or, or sea walls, formal walls have been put up at some time. I didn't know it, but within moments, with just a few strokes of his pen, Joe had eliminated not only our three other locations, but the infinite number of possible sites around Houston. Now the question became, how detailed could he get? Many vertical lines that are perpendicular one to the other, but the horizontal lines seem to have curves to them. And the actual target itself is uh, more up on an incline. Remember, at this moment, Joe is attempting to see what Jessica is seeing. Now she's looking up. So there's something tall at the target. She keeps looking up at it. I want to say there's like a, a bridge nearby. My sense is the bridge isn't meant for traffic, it's meant more for people. As you're going through this process, is this con confined just to visual? Some of it's visual, but some of it's also hearing or smells or taste or just sensations. Towards the end of Joe's session, a huge cargo ship docked right in the middle of our location, dramatically altering the target site. I'm just getting a lot of uh, metallic noise. There, there's something else down here as well. It's a very, very large object. I don't think it's a building. I don't know what that is. Uh, but this is a very large, very large object. Something tall behind the part of the entry. And then I get sort of a, almost a specifically designed platform. I get, a, I get a feeling like there's a black stripe down the center of it or something. This is about probably all I'm gonna get on this target. It was now time to go to the target site. Remember, Joe's impressions included a bridge, a river improved by man, seawalls, a very large object, and lots of metallic noise. When we arrived, we met Jessica, and unbelievably, we saw what she saw. A bridge, a river improved by man, a very large object, and a barge used for dredging. This is scary. Take a look at that, and then take a look at the barge in the water yeah. and the shape of that. It looks exactly like that structure. Were you looking at that during, during the, the I process? looked at that a lot because I, you know, looked all down in that direction, so I did this look at it a lot. What really impresses me is this large object. Uh-huh. And I'm, and I'm looking, <laughs> looking at this ship, yeah. and I just, I, I can't believe it because that's, that's right on the nose. Now, in terms of the bridge, you said you thought it was more foot traffic than, than yeah. automobile. Uh, that's obviously something that twisted the interpretation. Uh, generally speaking, about 80% of what I do say usually turns out to be right. correct. Uh, Are you pleased with the way this turned out? Yeah, I'm pleased. I think uh, out of all the places that we could have been around Houston, this is uh, 
very much fits the picture of the area. About 20% of what Joe does is as close to spectacular as I could possibly wish. Scientists don't like to use the term miracle very often, but this is as close to one as you can imagine. Coincidence, chance, or an extrasensory ability that exists in all of us. If you were skeptical, like I was, then perhaps what Joe McGonigal accomplished today opened all of our minds just a bit. Reporting from the Houston Ship Channel, I'm Bill McIntyre. There's some backstory to this. Uh, Joe called me when it was over and I was in California, exhausted. And that's a fairly common experience people have. And I said, you know, this was his first time on, on television. And I said, you were so brave to do this. He said, Ed, do you think I'm gonna do remote viewing on national television? Forget it. He did it at breakfast before he went to the office, I mean, to the studio. So we love precognition, guys. Okay. Former secret program, and we take it very seriously. I call your attention to the, yeah, right. First off, uh, I grew up in Tucson as a Jewish Hungarian cowboy. And uh, this proves the case. I used to do that standing on the back of a horse loping through the, uh, uh, the field at, uh, in Tucson. Now, Joe and I were in Moscow together, and he said, Ed, I'm not flying home with you. I'm gonna ride home in my faithful steed at the Moscow Zoo. I think he's still sitting there, actually. It's quite a while. Okay, now the serious stuff. What was the Stargate program? It was a 23-year program, $20 million, funded by the military and intelligence community, and this is chump change to them. Although, as, as far as I know, and maybe Stanley can correct me, it is the largest funded parapsychology research program in history. Missions, we had three missions. Gather intelligence, and if we could collect intelligence, so could the bad guys, and that means they could spy on us and we could spy on them. But uh, so our job was to figure out what was the threat. And lastly, conduct two types of research, which you'll see how to make the product, the output better. You know, should we face uh, Ryan Center or something like that or eat M&Ms or what have you? And then try to figure out how it all worked with basic research. In 2000 and 2003, the CIA released 11,067 documents. And uh, <laughs> poor the folks here had to go through a hell of a lot of them. <clears throat> okay. Um, Stargate Archives, which are a collection of books that Sonali and I put together, uh, which is based on those, all those documents. Four volumes, eight and a half inches, double column, 600 pages to, to 715 each. And I won't bore you this, I got married to PowerPoint here with this many number of, not PowerPoint, Photoshop, <laughs> to put them for publication quality. Now, I love beating up on the CIA whenever I get a chance to. <coughs> CIA released a lot of classified documents, and you can see up here at the top, that's a formal release. It used to be a secret document. And they have many copies of the same thing with different redactions. So all of the ones we can see, except the one I put in here, uh, the former director of the CIA, William Kobe, right here, his signature was redacted. So this is, I didn't cheat. This is a real odd do document. Now, it turns out they did redact something really foolish. They didn't redact the poor guy, uh, Carl Duckett, who actually wrote this memo to get permission to start the program. They just redacted his signature, and you can begin to see a little tail of it right here. How stupid can you get? Okay. Um, there's the secret thing. There's William Colby. There's Carl Duggett. Two successes from the Stargate research, and you'll see a lot more than these. This is a result from Ingo Swan, and it was a from a National Geographic picture. It was chosen at random, and um, basically he nailed it. He said there's a bridge, and it's hard to read all of these things. AOL. Uh, it turns out it's on uh, the Colorado River at Page Dam. Here's an example from spying that was done um, again with Ingo Swan. Instead of registering his response in writing, he did it in modeling clay. And he said, this is a huge device, a uh, flat pit, uh, pit, four-sided pyramid, it's big, and you don't want to be in it whenever it is running, which is correct. And uh, this thing here was, oops, oh darn it, get back here, sorry. Uh, this thing, 
Uh, he didn't know where it fit in. These were supposed to be guiding missiles here and cut it in half to show it was like. This is a uh, overhead photography from satellite of that era. This is what the place looks like today. It's 400 meters on a side. It is an over the horizon defense radar system. And we have permission to get on board, go inside this, fort, this still classified site with a film crew as part of a documentary. Stargate archives, here are the four. They're in cabinet five, I was surprised to see. <laughs> um, the first three are written, are, are documents from the contractors, uh, the SRI and SAIC and us, and all the overhead and what have you. The last one, volume four there on the far right, this one, is uh, mainly government documents, you know, site visits and analyses and all that sort of stuff. Okay. We have a forward. You should never do science by CV, but I'm about to do that here. This is the former Secretary of Defense under the Clinton administration wrote forwards for the, all four of these books, basically saying it's fantastic. Uh, people, some of you may know Richard Broughton, very well-known uh, researcher from the Rhine Center, now living permanently in the UK. Uh, he was head of the SPR in, in London, and he wrote a forward for the first three volumes saying, how is this work going to affect future parapsychology research? Did a real good job of it. Here's a site map for, the, for uh, Stargate. Three tasks. Gather intelligence, do a foreign assessment whether it was a threat, and two types of research. And one of the things you have to do is integrate what you've done in the, in the normal collection process for other techniques. Otherwise, it's no good whatsoever. Okay, overlaying all of this is oversight. We had more oversight than a test dummy at a, a dentist convention. I usually rephrase that with another orifice, but I'll leave that alone here. Um, and overlaying all of that was this. I spent more time in Washington on my knees begging for money and keeping the program alive rather than doing my job. ESP is real and it is useful. And it, it bothers me a little bit. I hear people say, well, precognition is interesting if it's real. And I'd like to go toe to toe with anybody who said that because it is real and I can verify it with statistics in any way you like. Not mine, Jessica Utz, former former chief statistician of the entire United States. Okay, um, between, uh, we, we did spying missions, 504 separate spying missions that required uh, nearly 2,900 uh, 2, separate remote viewings by, by the military and SRI people to accomplish these missions. Those were spread out over 19 different alphabet soup agencies, CIA, DIA, uh, FBI, and so on. Well, the FBI shouldn't have been doing it, but they had one. And of those, 17 of those original 19 people, including the CIA, came back with additional missions. I won't bore you too much with the chart, but this, what this tells you is these alphabet soup agencies, there's the CIA. CIA came back 41 times, different missions. And the all-time record was a uh, place in, in the Bay Area uh, with a joint task force. They were charged with drug interdiction at the end of the Cold War. They came back 172 separate missions. And their job asked us, where can we pick up a boat loaded with contraband, cocaine or whatever, you know, two weeks from then, uh, and the West Coast in U.S. territorial waters. We were mighty good at that job. Okay, there are a lot of uh, unclassified nicknames of the project. Gondola Wish, Grill Flame, which is a big one, Center Lane, Sunstreak, and Quantum Leap. I was walking out of the, out of the Pentagon with, my, with a colonel who was in charge of our program at that time. He says, Ed, got great news. We named your program Quantum Leap. And I said, oh, do, do we have to? He says, why? Quantum Leap progress is the smallest possible progress above absolutely none. I hate that name. <laughs> and he said, OK, OK. And thus was born Sun, uh, Stargate. Now. I had a uh, program from Huntsville, Alabama. We used to, unfortunately, call it Hunts Patch, but we, we, anyway, they gave me a lot of money to conduct a random number generator experiment, and the uh, program director there was going to Washington, this long before PowerPoint, with a cover slide to introduce the topic. So he told people it's grill flame and it involves remote viewing. They came up with this. <laughs> 
And I said, no way in hell are you taking that to Washington. So now it's part of my giggle briefing. <laughs> OK, Stargate brief history. It's really brief. Uh, SRI International from those years, $17 million worth of spending. And uh, the whole program deserves the undying value and appreciation for Hal Putoff and Russell Targ for beginning this program. They did things that I could not do. So I joined the program later. All the, de all the uh, uh, data was, research data was declassified in 1989. And we had, as I said, more oversight than you could imagine. But here's the interesting part to me. Um, this is a tiny program in this kind of circle. Really? Well, why is it President Carter, Vice President George H.W. Bush, and so on, all these big names, knew about our program, had been briefed by the program director, uh, Dr. Jack Verona, and approved what we were doing. That's amazing to me. I don't know how the hell that happened. It shouldn't. I mean, it's, that would be for a $5 billion program or something like that, not ours. Some accomplishments. <coughs> a fundamental test of model of how psychic, uh, how psychics, uh, experimenters, uh, a model of psychic experimenters, sorry. Thermodynamic model about how precognition might work. Characterizing ESP transmission. A research methodology to elicit high quality uh, psychic phenomena nearly on demand called remote viewing. A host of practical applications of psychic phenomenon. Here's some stuff that didn't work. Develop a, a valid remote viewing training procedure uh, and so on. You can read that better than I can. Uh, the bottom one there was, was not effective in educating government personnel proper protocols on how to use this stuff. And that was really frustrating. <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> OK. Here's a few examples. Again, uh, I focus your attention up here. Joe McMonagle, we did a lucid dreaming experiment. And this is just one trial. Physicists like to say, oh, it's just our typical best ever. Uh, Joe can do lucid dreaming. I'll remind you briefly about what lucid dream is. It's not just vivid. You become aware in your dream that you're actually dreaming. And I think most of you all know that. And you can actually wiggle your eyes. And so by monitoring that, you can signal the wake, waking world that you're dreaming. So when the way this trial works, uh, we tell Joe, Joe McMonagle, by, by the way, did this. When you have a lucid dream, signal us, get out of your dream, and go in the next door laboratory, and you'll find an envelope on the wall, open the envelope, study the photograph that's in that return, wiggle your eyes, and we'll wake you up. OK. We did all that. And he, before he drew all this for us, he said, you know, I did everything you said. I went into the lab, and I couldn't find that damned envelope. He says, but I realize I'm dreaming. I kicked my heels together, and I said, I want to go to where the photographer stood who took the picture that's in the, in the envelope I can't find. That's what he did. Whether he did, who knows. So uh, I've translated some of the scratches so you can read it more carefully. Key mountain barn or large cabin in shadow, shadow mountains, trees, and so on. Path, American Rockies, or maybe Alps. I think it's the Alps, actually. OK. The, le the envelope picture he couldn't find was that. Now, I'll tell you, I couldn't draw it that well looking at the damn photograph, let alone by being psychic. So I said to Joe, hey. You're really slipping, pal. When you're done with this, you miss the bloody car. OK. Uh, this isn't actually spying, but it's leading up to spying. We were asked, can you use remote viewing to detect directed energy weapon systems? And we did so with uh, three trials. They, uh, the, the funder was AFTAC, Air Force uh, Threat Assessment Center. Uh, they gave us $50,000 for each single remote viewing. They were really serious about this. And this is part of what Joe drew, uh, six by four centimeters. And uh, this thing, if you know anything about microwaves, this looks like a microwave uh, guide. Um, wrapped environment, uh, measurement of shock waves. And actually, this thing here looks like an antenna, actually. And wave front emitter. General Effects Test and Overall Evaluator. This was what was called Project Rose on the grounds of Sandia National Laboratory. It's a microwave generator in a wrapped environment. And that's what this thing looks like. And they were doing destructive testing of electronics to see whether these microwave beams would destroy the electronics. 
Now, I did something after the fact. I measured, um, whoops, darn it, wrong, wrong button, sorry. I um, measured this angle, and that turned out, probably by accident, the beam spread angle of that device, for whatever that's worth. Here are some more spine examples. Um, this was, I think, Ingo. He was given the geographical coordinates, which is the way he liked to work. And that's the site from, uh, photo from Google Earth. That's the coordinates. And he said there's a river. There was a river. There's an odd-shaped building. Um, he said lot, there's a, a city northwest of uh, this particular place. Uh, and sure enough, there was one. That's uh, shrug, you know, shrug your shoulders. Here's another one by, again, Ingo, I think. Instead of registering by drawing and writing, he cut out construction paper and glued it on a white background. This was a, a, an air, air base in, uh, in Persia, Iran. I took the picture and rotated it to line up more closely with the picture. And sure enough, uh, <clears throat> oops, that worked out pretty well. You can see it yourself. There's the coordinate system. There's the runway. Uh, not bad. But this is the best, the next one. This one was an intelligence first. Um, some weeks before the event, the uh, remote viewer, a guy named Gary, said, um, please, what you, can you tell us about the target of interest? That sounds like too much magic to me. What do you mean the target of interest? Who the hell knows what that was? But nonetheless, uh, the viewer was blind to the target, and so were all the people investigating. Uh, an event of interest, no further information was given. A few days later, after the event, the viewer again blind targeted on event of interest. That's what it looks like there. And here's what uh, Gary drew. He says, whatever's going on, it's like Roman candles going whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. It turns out, which I didn't know, if you set fire to plutonium, not blow it up in a bomb, it does, it does exactly that. And the, the folks at the proper agency gave me this picture of when they did set fire to some plutonium. And that was the first. We knew then, as a result of this remote viewing, that that nuclear dro airdrop test failed. <coughs> OK. Another one. Uh, Hella Hammond, a magnificent artist photographer, uh, did this uh, for a site in Nevada. It was a rocket test site, a static rocket. She, had known no, she knew nothing about rockets. All she knew about was steam engines. So she said it's a steam engine on a track, and there is a uh, uh, makes a lot of smoke. And rain-making machine, which is there to cool down the, the rocket engine. Now, I need to have a show of hands. I'm about to show you something that the CIA has never asked me, has enjoyed me never to tell anybody, but I'm breaking the rules. Will you all promise not to tell anybody about this? Hands, oh, come on, guys. You can raise your hands. Thank you, thank you. OK. <laughs> this is a theoretical physicist with powers of ESP stealing a thought experiment from a colleague. The Russians. Stan will appreciate that picture. That's St. Basil's at the edge of Red Square. This guy is General Alexei Yurovich Sabin. He ran the Russian remote viewing program, and you'll see more about that here. I got to know the guy after 20 years, and we're good friends now. And I said, hey, Alexei, how can the hell can you stand up with all that metal on your chest without falling and breaking your nose? This is what he looks like now. He has two PhDs, one in philosophy and one in mathematics. This guy is no slouch. He had 120 remote viewers at the height of the war spying on us. And when Joe McMonaco and I went to visit there together, um, these were some of the remote viewers. Now, what was really interesting, this was a two-day conference we had. This guy was present. I had no idea. I was not introduced to him. He was there all the time. <laughs> OK. Some remote viewers, they get weapons training. They get hand-to-hand -hand combat training. These are remote viewers, damn it. They had to have do all go through this stuff. This is Elena Klimova. Uh, she was a, a major in the, in the uh, Soviet Army, or Russian Army, actually. And um, I had a chance to work with her and Joe at the same time. I, uh, they did remote viewing on the same target, and I was in charge of it all. 
she is ever much as good a remote viewer as Joe McMonagall was, is. And she has on her chest a, a medal. This is what that medal looks like. It is uh, a, to de demonstrate you are members of the really secret remote viewing spying group in Russia called romantically 10,003. So uh, this means, I think Stan can correct me, but this means general staff. And they reported to the director of uh, general staff in the military there, and that's equivalent to our uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Very high profile. There's Alexei and me uh, in 2015. This guy is Boris Ratnikov, uh, general of the KGB. He was a head of the security detail for Yeltsin. And he would change Yeltsin's travel plans based on psychic information. Um, he has a great sense of humor, which I won't bore you with. You don't expect KGB guys to be funny, but he's a stitch. Um, here we are. Uh, this is Angela Ford, one of our best remote viewers. This is uh, Vacheslav Ivanovic. Uh, and this guy is General uh, um, uh, Nikolai Sham, who wrote uh, the foreword. He was second in command at KGB, and he wrote a foreword for one of our books, ESP Wars. This guy is a very interesting character. His name is Tofa Dadashev, and he was the chief uh, psychic for the KGB during the Cold War. He is magnificent. Um, he, has a, he has a business now, making a ton of money, actually, uh, doing psychic stuff for business people in Moscow. Uh, he's Azerbaijani. Um, I met him about five years prior to this, and uh, we got along really well. He hates the media. I hate the media. He doesn't think PK is real. I don't think PK is real. So we, we really resonated very well together. And uh, so when, we were, when Angela and I were there in 2015, he said, I'll tell you what, um, Ed, I know I hate the media, but if you're doing a documentary, I'll do whatever you want. So he stands by for that. And what's interesting, uh, he brought his son, so there were his son, Angela, uh, Victor Rubel, and me, four of us for dinner, and it, at the Four Seasons Steakhouse, right outside the house from Red Square, the meal probably cost a thousand U.S., and he would not split it with me. He insisted on paying the whole thing. And I said, okay, when you come to the U.S., I buy all the meals, and he said, agreed. This is um, Yuri Goryaev. Uh, Stan, well, who he was, he was former head of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, he speaks quite fluent English. I met him, oh, 10 years earlier than this picture. Um, he is uh, an, uh, an acoustic uh, scientist, and he told me that every single mobile phone on the planet has his uh, invention in it. And I said, God, you must be really rich. He said, no, the Soviets hold the patent, sadly. Uh, but I told him about our work in entropy, and I won't bore you the details of that. But he invited me to be in his laboratory for a year to figure out how to use that and build literally a chip, a solid-state chip that is psychic. And I would have loved to have done that had it not been for the language difficulty it would have happened. There we are, drinking too much stuff, as very common, <laughs> Angela and I. These are the two books. Um, the only book I'd recommend you really buying is this guy. It's uh, $5 on, on Kindle, and it's got very funny things in it, and it also tells you the history of some of the remote viewing during the, the, so, uh, during the uh, Third Reich era. And this is a version of it in Russian. It says, instead of, Psy, uh, this, instead of ESP wars, it says Psy wars, West and East, instead of East and West. And I translated this for a history of the accounts of eyewitnesses. It's a nice book. And we were there to promote it with a huge audience. And Angela and I kept being billed as CIA spies. No, no, don't bill us that in all the public media, which they did. Um, now, one thing that's really interesting from, from an experiential point of view, the whole talk was in Russian. And I had Olya here, a close friend of mine. She works for an American company, totally fluent in English. And this is Victor Rubel doing that same thing for Angela. And when it was all over, I asked Olya, do you know what you were telling me? And she says, absolutely not. Russian in here, English out here, without any cognitive awareness. And to me, that's more interesting than anything I've heard in this conference so far. How the hell can you do that? Well, it's sort of like if you're typing, you need an L. You don't think, well, I've got to push this finger down. So it's something related to that, I suspect. Uh, this was uh, at Christmas time in Moscow. 
if uh, Vladimir Lenin could lift his head over his body and just look to his left, he would have seen this. I don't think he would have been a happy character. This is the Duma, uh, and that's what this says here in Cyrillic. That's the lower house, and he would have been surprised to see a Christmas tree there. This is a very important picture. I don't know how many of you recognize this building, but it had a horrible reputation. It's called, it was originally called Lubyanka, which was the KGB headquarters and prison. Once in, never out. And um, the Russians, uh, after the Cold War, changed the name because they were a little embarrassed about it. They changed the name of the building, I don't remember what it was, but they failed to change the metro stop getting there. It's still Lubyanka Square. <laughs> But I thought it was really poignant to have that picture with one of the top uh, intelligence analysts in the whole of the United States standing in front of this building. It shows you how things have changed. Finally, a few sides first. There was only one day where it was really cold. Most of the time, there was no snow, even in December. OK, now, um, a number of people here have asked me about decision augmentation theory. How do you use precognition? to get a result that you don't deserve. So I have a two-slide show here, and we're almost done. That is, uh, for a medical trial, you have a population, right? And if you're really good at it, you have a control group, and you have a, 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 a uh, treatment group, and you have a unbiased random process that sort these little critters, OK? And then you have an assistant who is blind to whether she's got a placebo or a drug in there. And she administers that, and lo and behold, I made up a statistic. It showed for sure what was ever in the non-placebo thing was healing. Ha uh ha, -huh. not so fast. Except in any normal population, there's quite a, a, a difference. Um, they're not uniform. There's fat and healthy guy. There's a skinny couch potato, <laughs> um, and so on. And as before, control and a treatment group, except this time, People use their psi in pressing buttons to bias the sorting. And what that means is you inadvertently, you're not cheating, uh, put the more healthy guys in the treatment group and the sickier guys in the control group. And that actually happened in real life with Elizabeth Targ in the study she was doing in San Francisco. She didn't normalize uh, uh, in terms of severity of disease. And we make sure that there's no active drug anywhere. It's both placebo. And guess what? You get the same exact same statistic. That's called decision augmentation theory. Concluding remarks. During Stargate, we had sufficient financial support to hire experts. Instead of we amateurs, we could hire the good guys. Scientific oversight, including two Nobel laureates who held our feet and everything else to the fire. Substantial amount of new experiments and data. But, and we thought we had blazed new trails. I mean, we, we did it. We had all that money. We're great. Pat ourselves on the back. But we were wrong. This is a book I would recommend getting. It's called Extrasensory Perception. Um, it's hard to read. A critical appraisal of the research uh, of extrasensory perception over the last 40 years. This book was printed in 1940, 60 years, rather. And I, I read that book, and here's one of the quotes. The history of science has shown repeated adjustments in the scientific philosophies of the different uh, periods of history under the impact of new experimental evidence. In particularly every instant, it is the sci scientific philosophy that has given way, not the experimental evidence. And that is ever an important point. It is by appeal to experiment that de defects in reasoning are discovered. This is a fabulous book. I couldn't put it down. I read it cover to cover in one sitting. Thank you very much.